Welcome to the Stoic Sound podcast, where we talk about life, love, work, play, the universe, and a bit of Stoicism. Welcome everyone to the Stoic Salon podcast. It's a podcast where I want to talk with other women who have been influenced by, who read Stoicism, who have a Stoic practice um, and who have varied lives. And I'm really curious about how, how Stoicism can help enhance our lives. And today, Brittany Pollitt is here with me. And I think you've just popped in from the gym or you've been exercising. <laughs> Sweaty appearance. I was getting in my morning exercise. Yeah. Do you exercise at home? I do. Yes. I've been doing a lot of yoga and um, cardio as well. So it gives me a chance to kind of reflect. It's kind of my time to, to think about what I've been reading, what I've been practicing with stoicism and kind of consolidate what I'm learning. So it's definitely an essential time. I'm really curious about how exercise and sort of physical exercise, um, you know, allows you the space to think about your stoic practice and how does it, how does that work? Yeah, well, for me, I'm, I'm very introverted, so I, I don't really go out for the team sports and that kind of thing. Obviously, my choice of exercise is yoga and and jogging, <laughs> that kind of thing. So it's just a time for me to, um, like I said, kind of consolidate. I feel like when you're out in the world, you're doing a lot of things, you know, you have a lot of signals coming at you and then you need some processing time, or at least I do. Mm -hmm. I also have a, a busy family life. I'm always taking the kids to karate lessons, birthday parties, my least favorite thing in the world, kids' birthday parties. Sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's just kind of <laughs> time to to bring it all back together and, and think about how I'm incorporating my, my principles into my, my life. So you mentioned exercise and family, and I've only recently met you. I mean, I, of course, I'd read you and seen you online, but I've only recently personally met you, well, via Zoom, because we're collaborating on the Stoic on X Women um, Conference. But tell me more about you. Who are you? And just a bit about your journey to stoicism or yeah what what's what happened sort of before you met stoicism and and then i guess i'll ask you about the post stoic <laughs> brittany sure well do i get to ask you the same questions after? yeah of course <laughs> absolutely I, i'd love to talk about myself actually <laughs> All right. you want me to start no you start <laughs> So, yeah, I, like many people, I think I came to stoicism during a crisis in my life. Mm. I mean, I think you have to kind of be mentally prepared to accept this philosophy in a lot of ways, because it is, it's quite different. I call mm. it countercultural in a lot of ways, because it's, you're basically learning to see the world differently from the way you've probably grown up. If you're like most people, you know, if you weren't raised by someone with very similar viewpoint. Um, our culture in general is really materialistic, obviously, emphasizes external success and constantly uh, achieving these external goals. Um, so I came to it at a point when I had three children. I had recently moved to a new town for my husband's job. Mm. Uh, I had more or less come to the conclusion that I was giving up my academic career. I, was, I did a PhD in applied linguistics and was really committed to that field and after having children, it was just, um, you know, it's always a conflict, I think, between mm. professional and personal life, especially for women. Mm. Mm. So I, it, it was very difficult for me. I had invested so much of myself, both mentally, physically, you know, professionally in this, in this field. And it was really, really difficult to realize that, wait a minute, now I'm basically, I'm just staying at home with the kids. I don't really have a, an outlet for my professional identity anymore. Very, very difficult. Lots of anxiety, depression. Also, you know, the whole thing with the move and all of a sudden, hey, what am I going to do with these three kids? You know? <laughs> so it was, it was a very, very difficult time for me. 
And obviously stoicism was not the first philosophy or idea that I had looked into. I think many people look around, you know, I, I definitely looked into Buddhism. I looked into a few other ideas as well. And like so many people reading about stoicism, and for me, it was through Bill Irvin's book, A Guide to the Good Life. Again, <laughs> so many people have found stoicism this way. I'm a total mm-hmm. cliche. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, that was it for me. And then Well, I- 2,000 years ago, it would have been a stoa. So, you know, and everyone would have. <laughs> right, right. Don't feel too bad. Yeah. Um, but that's another reason why I ultimately wrote my parenting book, Tranquility mm-hmm. Parenting, because... It, it was such a powerful and compelling force for good in my life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, once you learn about it, it's like, wait a minute, why did I never hear about this before? Mm-hmm. And I wanted to make sure that I could share that with other parents as well. So I wrote mm-hmm. the book, Tranquility Parenting, for people who had never heard about stoicism, who might not normally pick up a book on philosophy, just as a way to kind of introduce them to the idea. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so my practice just grew from there. Um, and... I found that the more into it I got, the more committed I was, the happier I got. So it was one of those things where, you know, sometimes people are like, why do you keep doing it? What keeps you interested after multiple years? And I think it's just the results. You see the results. Your life gets better. You're happier. The anxiety, the depression kind of fade away. So, yeah, but that's why I'm here. That's why I'm still doing it. Wow, you've brought up so much. First of all, the doing it, which I need to ask you because I'm really interested in what it means to do Stoic philosophy or to do to have a Stoic practice. What's the doing bit? I'm really interested in the practical implica- um, applications of right. this philosophy. I come from a philosophical background. I mean, just undergraduate and a bit of master's, um, you know, all the armchair philosophies. <laughs> so for me, Stoic philosophy is quite different. And when I recently came to it, I was... And I think I one of my first kind of really intentional interactions with Stoicism was during one of um, the Stoic Week. I think it was maybe 2016, 2015, 2016. And I was, I, I found it such an intensely social experience, um, which I, I hadn't really expected. So the whole idea of you know, working and, and, and work, doing your writing practice, et cetera, but then also going out in the community to talking to other people, um, practicing in that way through conversation, through discussion. Um, I just think of like the Stoa where like Zeno was like this. He, I think Zeno was really active. I mean, physically active at the Stoa. He was like like walking, pacing up and down while talking. Do you have that image of Zeno at yeah, all? I think, yeah. I think that's what the reports say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I do like the idea of, of that, um, yeah, that social aspect. Um and the doing. So I need to remember to get back to you. I'll make a note. Uh, I want to ask you, when you say that, um, so you, you came to Stoicism through hardship, um, was, was the interaction, was the meeting with Stoicism natural? Because I think it was Bill Irvin I was listening to, I think it was the Scotland Stoics podcast. He was on it just a couple of weeks ago or uh, last year, sorry, uh, just before Stoicon. Um, so last October. And he mentioned that when he finally came across Stoicism, it was just such a natural thing. And he felt that he kind of maybe always was to a certain degree Stoic or had the basic elements naturally and also a friend of mine who's in my stoic salon group mary bates she's a physician in um, new hampshire and she senses that she has this intuitive or had this intuitive grasp of stoicism even as a child does that resonate with you did you find this easy i'm not saying the practice then doesn't become you know hard like not hard but it's a commitment but did you find it made sense immediately to you was it easy in that sense it did for me it immediately made sense i i wasn't um i didn't identify as a stoic um uh, from the point of view like oh yeah i've always been able to shake things off easily like on mm. the emotional front because this is where i've mm. had to do a lot of work is the emotional part of stoicism but the things um, that really appealed to me were the the antithesis of materialism Mm. i mean i i yes i definitely had the feeling where have you been all my life it was like you know true love at long last (laughs) (laughs) um 
so yeah, I would say it was definitely organic. Um, and the more I read, the more convinced I was. I actually, after Bill Irvin's book, I read Donald's book, um, Stoicism and the Art of Happiness. Mm -hmm. And he talked about Pierre Hadot in there. And then I read Pierre Hadot and Hadot's work really convinced me that this would be a viable philosophy of life. It's yeah. not just a self-help trend. Yeah. It's not a life hack. It is a full philosophy of life, full bodied yeah. and very rich. Um, so that's one reason I, I also like to recommend Hado to others. You know, mm -hmm. some people don't like him. And I also recognize stoicism is not for everyone. Mm -hmm. Some people don't identify with it. Um, and that's totally fine. I think that mm -hmm. most people can identify with some of the tenets, like um, putting community and other people ahead of material goods, that kind of thing. I think certain stoic ideas definitely resonate with a lot of people. And that's because they are, it's wisdom, right? It's very similar to what a lot of other wisdom traditions say and have said throughout the ages. Mm. It's so interesting to do those comparisons, you know, between Stoicism and Buddhism, or my favorite Confucianism and Stoicism, mm. or, you know, anytime you're looking at a wisdom tradition, I think the kernel of putting um, other people before yourself, or distancing yourself from your emotions, this kind of thing, making yourself comfortable with death, all of that, it, it's mm. there in many wisdom traditions. Mm. So stoicism isn't for everyone, but I think it's for a lot of people. Mm. What was it in Bill Irvin's book that just, if you could like pull out a quotable quote or something, <laughs> sorry to simplify it, but what was it that really sparked something what was the essence of Bill Irvin's book? Because then the, my next question is going to be, what happened then when you met Haddo? Yeah, so I, I think one of the main things I actually got from Bill Irvin's book is just having a philosophy of life. So I did not come from a philosophy background at all. I, I think I was interested in it as a teenager, and I, I read a book, Introduction to Philosophy, something like that, and hated it because it was dealing mostly with, you know, the theoretical side of philosophy. And then you get to the 20th century, and it's completely abstract. And although I, I love language, it was just language in a way that nobody could really use. So to me, philosophy had always seemed very theoretical, and I wasn't interested in it. So I guess when I, when I read Irvin's book, and his views on, hey, you need a philosophy of life. This is what philosophy of life is. So I guess maybe just the idea that stoicism could be a philosophy of life. And that also made it into my book on parenting. So that's what I also started out with because I found it was so effective. So, hey, even if you don't end up going with stoicism, ultimately, you need some kind of philosophy of life. So if you decide mm -hmm. you're Epicurean or Buddhist or whatever you are, you need to have some kind of guide. So I think for me, that was the big hook, as opposed to just going through life in a reactive way without having a clear sense of, of what to do or where your compass mm. is. So mm. I, I think that was it. Did you find something similar? Or you came from a theoretical background, so I guess it was different for you. Yeah, so I encountered the Stoics. Well, actually, um, I didn't encounter the Stoics on campus because you didn't do the Stoics on campus. You did all the more kind of, you did Plato, Aristotle, and then you, you jumped ahead to Hume, I think. I don't know. Um, um, but came across the Stoics off campus. So um, in Newtown, where I lived in Sydney, I went to the University of Sydney. We were, we actually engaged in um, some philosophy and drama nights. And one of the professors then, Ed Spence, who uh, is from um, Kittium. So, of course, Zeno was legendary, right? So he, well, you know, he was from it's Cyprus. But uh, um, so he used to write dialogues. And from there I kind of met some of the Stoics in the dialogues, which we performed in a Greek tavern <laughs> and then, like, it just did a kind of symposium sort of thing after it. So there was Greek wine and it's in a rather and food, etc. And that's where I met the Stoics kind of in the modern day Stoa, the, the tavern, um, and found them pretty boring because they didn't have that eloquence in right now at that, at that stage I hadn't read Marcus Aurelius I only read Marcus Aurelius in the last three or four years and so back then the Stoics seemed to me quite 
um, they weren't very literary and I really liked literary philosophers. I liked the language of philosophy and I wasn't into self-help back then because I was capital R romantic, capital R, capital T tragic, you know, all that stuff, you know, arts background. Um, so the Stoics were the, the furthest sort of thing and I, um, and then years later, I ended up in Greece and I lived in Preveza, which um, is on the west coast of Greece, on the Ionian, which is near, which is basically where Nicopolis, the ancient ruins of Nicopolis um, sort of exist now in, in, you know, absolute ruins, but a gorgeous site. So I actually got to, and at that point when I lived in Greece, <clears throat> do you know Tom Wolfe's um, A Man in Full? <clears throat> You haven't read it, <clears throat> excuse me, but you know the book. That was kind of the novel. So what, that was early, no, that was mid-90s, I think, um, late 90s, I think, 98 maybe, or I'm going to have to go back and check. But around about that time, that novel really made Stoic brought Stoicism back. And so I started then reading Epictetus because I happened to be in Bedevas and could walk around the ruins and thought, you know, yeah. So, yeah, came from a more theoretical background and, and thought that that was much more interesting and more complex. And then so very recently only came to the Stoics, as you say, very much um, because of hardship, <clears throat> thinking it was one sort of hardship and then it ended up being some some other sort of hardship. But nonetheless... A, a real block in life and um and then just the algorithms I think actually I think it was through CBT I think I was trying out a bit of CBT for um anxiety and sort of various stresses and then I think the Google algorithms or the Facebook algorithms then led me directly to Donald Robertson and um Stoic Week Modern Stoicism and then Stoic Week and just found a really nice community. I think it was really the community that really um, engaged me and, uh, yeah, have been exploring ever since. <clears throat> but the thing is that when I did read Haddo, that's when everything changed for me because initially I thought it might be. And I think also my intention was more I need a quick life hack, just fix a couple of things and then I'll get on my way. And then when I read Haddo, first of all, when I read Haddo and Marcus Aurelius, that changed everything the Marcus Aurelius text despite it you know being a text that doesn't really do philosophy doesn't do anything new in philosophy it's really just you know just rewriting reformulating the ancient texts but the language and if you sit really quietly with Marcus Aurelius reading him I I sort of went through a morning practice where I just sat with him read a bit and just copied his um extracts out and then just sort of did a bit of freeform journaling with it and that was my morning routine for a while and that's just the most beautiful gentle um, way of being and um, of a mindfulness and um, a way of just rehearsing uh, how to be in the world right and just reminding you of, of um of things anyway yeah so but then the Hado is interesting because Hado really sees it as you say a kind of a whole a holistic philosophy and I recently read and now I'm going to forget the philosopher's name but he wrote the some book in and the title has happiness in it philosophy of happiness or something like that who is he who is he anyway he mentioned that he was talking, what do you think? He was talking about modern Stoicism, not modern Stoicism, but Stoicism as it's kind of appreciated today. Oh, is this Darren Brown? Um, Dar uh, is it Darren Brown? Didn't he write a book called Happy? Happy. Yeah, I think it might be him. Is it him? I haven't read it, so I can't speak to it. I'm trying to think. Why is my mind stuck now? Well, you know, just <laughs> I'll, I'll 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 have to um come back to this. But um, he mentioned that um the actual beauty and the truth and sort of the way that that stoicism really needs a belief in some f cosmology. So it's not just going to work at the self-hacking, mind-hacking level. It actually, and he, he doesn't necessarily mean a, a religious sort of mm -hmm. belief, but some belief in some, some, some power greater than you. Um, 
And I think one, and I, I, I'm a very, 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 <laughs> very atheist, atheist. And, um, and that re, and so the initial problem, of, I think for a lot of people from, for a lot of atheists, stoicism, um, is problematic because of the cosmology. And so I think there's a sense, and you're going, please correct me on everything that I say, because I'm sure I'm getting this wrong. Um, there's a sense today that stoicism works without some form of, you know, physics, cosmology, and they can just pull parts away and just use what you will, which I'm sure that's probably okay. But for me, and I think that quantum mechanics and science today really allows you to reintroduce the mystery of a greater power. Um, anyway, I'm rambling, so I really need to give the mic back to you. So the Hado question, what happened with Hado and how do you th- how do you place your stoic practice? Does it need to be within this and not necessarily Christian, but even some sort of understanding of cosmology? Yes. So I think that is something that Hado can offer. And so I'm agnostic. I, I wouldn't call myself atheist, but to me, the, um, the unknown is unknown. It's always going mm-hmm. to be unknown. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't, you know, try to figure it out. But to me, it doesn't play a role in our philosophy of life. Mm-hmm. You, you can't know the unknowable. So you may as well get on with what, what you can see, what you can know, which mm-hmm. is our life here. So now I'm talking purely about my own personal philosophy and my own personal stoic practice. So this is not necessarily how other people would practice it. Yeah. Also, I have, I'm certainly not claiming this is how the ancients practiced it. it it's just the way I see it. So for me, we do have other branches of inquiry today that that look at, you know, the hard sciences, what's out there in the universe. Mm -hmm. To me, what I need a philosophy of life for is how to live my life. So the way I see stoic physics is that it tells us not what is out there, but how Mm -hmm. we should relate to what is out there. It describes our relationship, our approach to the wider world. Mm -hmm. So even if we don't know what the ultimate ultimate is, Mm -hmm. which I think we can never know that, we can still figure out how we should approach it, which is full of reverence, full of awe, Mm -hmm. uh, full of care and wanting to align ourselves Mm -hmm. with this incredible ineffable mm. how do likes to use the word ineffable mystery of the universe you mm. know so even if we don't use stoicism to tell us you know like what what the substance of the universe is and mm. they, they had a very very complex cosmology but yeah. we don't need physics to do that we need physics to tell us who we should be in relationship to the wider world and that goes mm. for the the cosmic aspect of the world but also the wider world as we interact with it every day Mm. Right. So this is the things like, you know, death and loss and and the big, hard problems of life. Right. Yeah. This is why we do need the physics, because without that, without that reverential relationship Mm. with the wider world, our our aligning our will with the rest of the world doesn't really make sense. You can't Mm. really lock it into anything if you don't have that bigger picture. Mm. Does that, do you agree with that? I love that and I I agree with that. And I think that the way you phrase it is stunning, like just the relational aspect. Um, And I think that, um, yeah, obviously, yes, you can't know. Um, Even quantum physics suggests that, you know, there's so much mystery. Quantum physics has opened up a door to mystery again. But the idea of understanding, and it's what Marcus Aurelius says, one day you're going to have to accept the type of world that you live in. And that, you know, it's whatever it is and your life is limited and you're a mortal. And I think that if we, yeah, that acceptance then clarifies a whole lot of frustration and just let's, you know, if, if we have an acceptance about how we relate to the world and how we are in the world and who we are in the world and our capacities as human beings, then there is no question or frustration about death, for example, because it's just that's the way it is. And it just seems like such a such a tiny little mind flip, but it's it's it makes all the difference because all the problems that we have about fear and anxiety about say death or grief etc. And I'm not suggesting we shouldn't grieve, you know, for short periods of time naturally, you know, compassionately etc. But um, ongoing grief is really an illogical way of dealing with 
the world. And I think, yeah, the way you say it, seeing ourselves in relation to this, the world. Right. I think we as, tend to, in yeah. our modern day, we tend to see ourselves as atomistic. You know, we're all yes. in our, especially during the pandemic, we're all in our own bubbles, right? <laughs> but, yeah. you know, we yeah. feel cut off from both literally, physically and metaphorically from wider society and the wider world. So to yeah. me, what the Stoics are doing or what they can offer us today, it's not oh. that literal interpretation of, you know, the pneuma is inside each person and, and this kind of thing. It's oh. our our approach to life. It's happening in your head, right? It's psychological. It's the way you orient yourself to this, yeah. going from that atomistic, this is good for me. I'm going to protect myself. You know, the self-preservation that we start yeah. off with as infants to opening up your circles of concern, you know, opening up yourself and breaking down those boundaries, or at least making the boundaries more permeable between yeah. what you consider yourself and the wider world. And that's the social world and the natural world. So going from that atomistic to a more inclusive viewpoint, I guess. Yeah. And I think that's what happened to me um, when I read Hado, and I'm talking about philosophy as a way of life because mm. everyone's going to die now, but I haven't read Inner Citadel yet, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, and I need to make a point about my dog barking. I actually live in a little cottage in southwest Scotland and it's next to a cemetery a tiny little cemetery, and I've been here for just over two years, and today is the first day that there is actually a bur burial taking place right now. So neither I nor the dog has experienced this before. So she's downstairs barking. and um, Okay, it's a great memento mori. It's a memento mori. It really is. <laughs> and, of course, living here next to these cemetery made, because I was like maybe two years into stoicism at that point when we moved here. But this made all the difference, <laughs> having that little cemetery right next door. Anyway, the Hado, um, yeah, ha he mentions at one point, and it's in the chapter on, and to everyone listening, um, I'm going to make some program notes, I think, because I think we're bringing up so much, Brittany, that um, I'm not quite sure who my audience is going to be yet, who our audience is going to be. So I will promise to make some notes. But um, the Hado really in the, I think it's the chapter on writing exercises where he goes back and talks about all the um, exercises that the ancients did, sort of spiritual exercises, he calls them. He said that that whole practice was a way of pulling us out of our own little egotistical balls or, you know, worlds and literally shifting. And he calls it a psychic transformation, like this psychic transformation from me to being part of the universe, just the, the human perspective and that was mind-blowing for me and and that's hard to do it's hard to do that every day but when you practice that shift in, and I'm going to ask you in a minute I'm going to go to the do point that you mentioned how do you do it but the Stoics have lots of activity um, you know exercises that you can do to pull yourself out of that very closed um, egotistical narcissist not narcissistic but yeah closed um, individualistic um, perspective and pull yourself out of that and um, yeah did you want to make a comment on on how that perspective just changes everything. I mean, I think you already did in terms of death, et cetera. But do you want to make a comment maybe on what practices do you implement? Because you talked about doing, doing. Mm -hmm. So what what are the what do you do? Yeah, one thing I like that Hado mentions is, you know, he distinguishes between theory and or between discourse and philosophy, he talks about it as two different poles. So at one pole, you have the discourse of philosophy, and on the other end, you have the daily life, the, the living it. So for me, I'm mainly interested in the discourse as it informs the living. So mm. a lot of times I'll go from my practice and then go revisit the theory and say, okay, so is this why the Stoics said this because when I do this, I feel this way. And so to me, it's kind of like a, a continuous loop. You really, you truly can't have one without the other. They, they mm. inform each other. Mm. But another thing I love about Hado is that he moves. Um, I think for a lot of philosophy, there's only one pole, the discourse. Yeah. So he kind of like moves the, the goalposts <laughs> to, 
to way over here to the practice. So, I, and, and one thing that he says also is that reading is a practice. So talking mm. about philosophy is a practice as well. So because you're kind of putting it more into your mind, you're kind of making it a part of who you are. And this is something that is really interesting to me and super important. I think it's something I've been thinking a lot about lately is how you actually take those principles and make them a part of who you are. Mm. So I think it has to do again with the self. And I've, I've been looking at theory from moral psychology, from contemporary moral psychology. There's a psychologist named Augusto Blasi mm-hmm. who has written a lot about this. And he, he says the moral self, the self is where it's at, basically. If you're looking at moral functioning, like how do we do it in our everyday life? And so for me, the question goes back to motivation. How do I stay motivated when all these difficult things are happening? You know, when I want to get angry, when I'm tempted to do something I shouldn't do, how do I stay motivated? So Blasi says, looking at moral functioning, you need to think about your identity. You need to think about yourself. You need to think about the degree of responsibility you feel towards the people around you um, for moral action. So there's a lot of really interesting things there, I think, that blend in with what the Stoics said. So I've been focusing a lot on identity. And I think, you know, identity can be a very fuzzy concept. You could you could talk for days about identity and get nowhere. You know, you could just go in circles. But I think we do all kind of have a sense of who we are. So mm. philosophy as a way of life and stoicism certainly goes back to that question, who are you? So it's about becoming a virtuous person, right? That, that's our ultimate goal. We, we want to live a good life. We want to be a good person, which the Stoics defined through this ancient term, virtue, arete. So the wisdom, the self-control, the courage, that kind of thing, it all goes, goes back into this one concept. So again, in our modern lives, we have all these pressures on us to be external characteristics, to be thin, to be smart, to be successful, to be rich, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Or you could even break it down further into... You know, I'm someone who likes to go camping. I'm a rock climber. I'm a jogger. Uh, I'm someone who likes ACDC or whatever. You know, we have all of these different parts of who we are. And our general culture doesn't really emphasize the character piece. And that character portion is essential, actually, to having a sense of who you are that's grounded in something bigger than yourself. So to me, it all goes back to this idea. Who are you? So who am Mm. I? So making that my number one identity is my character. And then everything else that I am kind of flows from that. So, you know, I'm, I'm a mother. I'm, you know, yeah. I don't have a professional identity at the moment, but for those who do, you know, I, I'm a writer, I'm a, a doctor, whatever. Mm-hmm. Those are all secondary to your primary identity, which is being a virtuous person. So that really helps you prioritize things, right? If you ever feel a conflict between your roles, you go back, okay, I'm, I'm an excellent person here, or I'm trying, right? We're, we're all trying. So I'm trying to be an excellent person. That's who I want to be. So it's really motivational mm-hmm. to see yourself in those terms instead of seeing this is just something that I do. This is who I am. And it's inherently mm-hmm. motivating. Mm-hmm. So that, that was kind of a jumping all around. but <laughs> that, that is sense? so interesting because this is, okay, I'm going to do this really quickly. It's just a tangent. I'm actually going to be talking about identity on social media Um on club clubhouse on sunday and the idea is yeah all the different professional roles etc that we have and i was posing the question how do all they link how do all of those identities link together to the one person because i find that i am splitting into different sort of social personalities or professional personalities identity i call them identities and then recently i did a workshop with um about um, setting goals, but inspired by um, the Stoics, in particular Epictetus. And you know the bit about Epictetus saying that imagine that you're a character in a play and your, your, your goal really is to perform the best that you can, that role that you've been given. And he says, you don't control the script. Someone else has written the script. Someone else has written the play. You're just there to do your role and um, that's it. So... Do you have anything to say about the Stoics? Because I I feel that our sense of identity is so much linked to our individual personal choice. Like we choose to be a mother or a writer, et cetera. 
I'm not sure about the virtue thing. I don't think anyone ever says I cho- I am a virtuous person, right? Well, when we're asked, we're trying to be. We're, we're trying, trying to be. <laughs> yeah. Um. And then, so how can you relate that to that Epictetus quote that where he talks about you're a character playing a role in a play that you didn't script, and you just play that role to the best of your ability. Does that is there a conflict there at all in terms of how identity and role and is perceived from I mean clearly our sense of identity has evolved over time um, but do you have anything to say about that or have I totally gone off on a different tangent No well I think when you bring Epictetus into the picture you have to talk about prohiresis which is his mm. sense of choice um, mm. in, it's translated in multiple ways but it was one of Epictetus's favorite terms. He used it all the time and it was kind of unique to him. Aristotle had used it. I think it was current in just in everyday use at the time as well, mm-hmm. but Epictetus really gave it a very specific sense. And, you know, when you read the Stoic scholars today, there's, there's not one final answer about what prohiresis is, how to translate it. Everybody has their own opinion. I call it a Rorschach test for Stoics everybody sees different things in it but it's kind of it can be translated as volition it can be translated as will sometimes he uses it in the sense of it's your moral character but a lot of times it's translated as choice or a faculty of choice or moral choice so it's the idea of our again going back to his the the famous dichotomy of control you know what do you control it's your choice and i see Mm. this as being yourself so talking about self and identity, that's what it is. It's your ability to make the decision in the moment to do something that aligns with your rational beliefs. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's also, going back to the way Epictetus uses it, it's more than just a momentary choice. It's also your character. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for that is because every time you make a choice, you are creating your character, right? Mm -hmm. So make a choice to you know, go exercise instead of eat a candy bar, that's, Mm. that's contributing to your physical fitness in the same way. If you make a choice to, um, to not talk about a friend behind their back versus you were going to say something really mean about them, Mm. you know, when you make that choice one way or the other, you're making your character more beautiful or less beautiful. Mm. As you repeatedly make those choices, you are creating yourself. You are creating who you are, you're creating your identity. And so this, this choice is actually your character at the same time because it's the result of all your previous choices. Mm. It's the accumulation of your choices. So that's mm. what your character is. So I definitely think identity is tied into that. Mm. And looking at the, you're, you're a character playing a role in a play. Well, yes, you are. And how you respond to that play, you know, you play your part well. That is who you are. That is mm. your choice to play mm. your part even if you don't get to choose the part you don't get to choose the script or whatever it is still your choice to play it well mm. so, yeah absolutely it's all tied mm. together <laughs> and that character in a play reminded me now of a documentary done on do you know the uh, rugby league team the new zealand rugby league team the all blacks no you don't know the all blacks oh man Here, okay <laughs> But anyway, there's this great documentary. They're kind of the greatest um, rugby league team in the world. And one of the players, he spent, I don't know, years maybe on the bench and he wanted to be on the field and he wanted to be playing and he wanted to like, you know, just really perform his best. But he was on the bench and I don't know what you do on the bench. Maybe you get the towels. I really don't know. But his dad told him, and I think that the team was, did read the Stoics because I think um, some, a lot of coaches use Stoic principles in training athletes, etc. And so he had, a, 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 you know, a kind of education in Stoicism. And it was his dad who actually said that, you know, your role is to sit on the bench. So every day you're going to go and you're going to sit on the bench and you're going to be the best person doing that 
or whatever. I'm paraphrasing this whole scenario, but um, so he did. He actually just did the best job on the bench and then he ended up, you know, matriculating to the, like got on the team and um, performed excellently well on the team. But it was that mindset of just like, this is my role right now. How can I perform this role to the best of my ability or with virtue or, or whatever you, you want to call it? And I think that's kind of really helped me now because I was really struggling with this whole identity thing. What do I want my business to be? What's my focus? Should I do this or that? And ultimately the question is, well, how will I perform best? How will I be my best person, right? Is it as simple as that or as hard as that? (laughs) Right, as hard as that because I think there's a lot of scope for individuality when Mm. you, you know, in building your character and in applying virtue. So we have this idea of, virtue as excellence, right? Being an excellent Mm -hmm. person. But what that looks like in each life, yeah, that's up to each person to determine. So it's both very freeing because Mm -hmm. you, you know, you determine that for yourself, but it's Mm -hmm. also kind of scary and a lot of responsibility, especially these days, because we have, you know, broken free of so many of the traditional roles, which Mm -hmm. in general is a good thing, I think, but it also leaves a lot of us wondering, okay, well, now what do I do? Who am I? Mm. So going back to that virtuous character or aspirational, right? This is, this is always aspirational. This is who I want to be going back to that first can help you make all the other decisions. Because if you are sitting on the bench, you can do so virtuously. If Mm. you are sick, you can be sick virtuously, right? But nobody else can really tell you what that looks like in your own life. And Mm. this is something that's actually helped me because, you know, in the Stoic community, there aren't a lot of people I see who are doing the same thing I'm doing. You know, you see a lot of um, people who are very heavily invested in philosophy careers or sports careers or whatever Mm. it might be. And my life is not going to look like theirs. My way of being in the world, even if I'm being an excellent person, is going to look totally different from other Mm. people's. Mm. So in that way, it's hard to look for a role model if you know people have very different roles or very different places in the world and there's Mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that you know we need all kinds of people in the world but it just puts a lot of responsibility back on your own shoulders to to think about what it actually looks like in your own life well yeah that is so interesting because ultimately what stoicism does is really make you accountable for yeah your choices and and while you were saying that, again, my mind's kind of going all over the place, but I thought of blame in interpersonal relationships, but also blame in terms of life situation, what what is brought to us, what professional opportunities we are offered. Um, I think that a lot of the way we interact with the world is through blame, blaming something going wrong, blaming the pandemic, blaming COVID, blaming the government's mismanagement of whatever blaming your partner, blaming your parents, your childhood, I don't know, the first teacher who told you 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 can't do art at school or whatever. So one thing that I've learned is how insidious blame is. I've realised through my stoic practice that in actual fact, I mean, I'm not a a, a finger-pointing blamer. Like I'll take, I'll happily take on the blame. But I noticed just how much I did blame like situations. So, oh, I can't do this right now because, whatever I don't have the money for it or anything um so blame exists um and I wonder um you know obviously there's a few more things I want to talk about before I let you go this is one thing how do you feel about that and suddenly with stoicism for me I realized that well it's it's so raw and simple and risky and dangerous and hard that really it's all in my head as bizarre as it sounds, I choose to take the responsibility for my thoughts and how I judge something, or I choose to blame the fact that my short story got rejected to give a classic writerly response. If I choose to not blame, but to look at me and my work, did I show up enough? Did I? Or you know, just will I continue to show up enough? Um, it changes everything mm-hmm. and it literally lifts a burden and you're happier because you're not constantly wondering or 
searching for something to, I mean, I think blame to a certain extent is a way of making meaning in the, like trying to draw meaning from something. Like why did this happen? Because of that. Um, I don't know. Any thoughts on blame and how stoicism, I don't know where that came from. I have never articulated that before, but is there anything there? Is there anything you wanted to <laughs> respond to? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think definitely accepting responsibility for your own thoughts is an important feature of stoicism. Mm. And I think it also goes back to that physics that we were talking about earlier, mm. that acceptance of this is the way the world is. You know, my teacher who said I can't do art in first grade, you know, I can't change that teacher. Maybe mm. she was having a bad day or something. She probably doesn't even remember that. Maybe she didn't say that and I was sensitive and I interpreted that, you know. Mm. So yeah. I think, again, getting us outside of ourselves, and that might sound contradictory because I was just talking about yourself, but mm -hmm. I think you have to balance, you know, the, the Stoics talked about both physics and logic and mm -hmm. ethics, mm -hmm. right? These are all, they're all components of your philosophy. So you, you think about yourself, but you also want to get outside of yourself sometimes, right? So putting that in perspective of, you know, the 7 billion people on the planet and the people who have existed before, the people who will exist in the future. So yeah, just, I think when you, when you really start to accept in a deep way that the world is the way it is and blaming is not going to help anything, right? You're, you've got to accept it. Going back mm. to that favorite stoic analogy of the dog being dragged along beside the cart, right? Mm. The dog is tied to the cart, the cart's moving, the dog's going to move with it. The dog can either run along beside it happily or be pulled kicking and screaming, right? And, mm. and that's the same for us. So blame is a waste of energy. And we should try to put that into acceptance of the way the world is. That's not to say we have to accept every single thing. Mm. You know, we, we do want to do our part to change what we can. But in general, you know, we're not going to be able to change very much about the world. Mm. So we have to accept a lot. Yeah. We're not often going to see change in our lifetime. We can only, yeah, do what we can. Um, I did want to go from blame to emotions in general, not that blame is an emotion necessarily, but um, because you did mention emotions. And I think now that my journey to stoicism went, as I said earlier, through CBT. And I feel that that was my attempt at managing emotions by becoming aware of them and, um, yeah, working on them, working on management. Um, so. And obviously Stoicism is, um, CBT is informed um, by Stoicism. But at the, same, at the same time, I think CBT, again, I think Stoicism, because it is more of a complete life philosophy and CBT is more like a, just a strategy, which I think works really well short term, but then I think um, you need a more holistic, a more sort of something beyond that to sustain the work done. And I think stoicism potentially provides that because it is a, a philosophy of life. But in terms of the emotions, um, obviously human beings naturally, um, you know, form emotions. Uh, do you have anything to say about emotions? But more from a just a daily management of emotions point of view. Um, rather than sort of bringing in the whole stoic kind of theory of emotions? Well, I do actually bring in the, the cosmic perspective to help deal with my emotions on a daily basis. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to sound too cosmic here, but situating yourself, you know, in the perspective of the bigger picture always helps me. It mm. always does. And the more I can do that, the more I can distance myself from those, you know, little bothersome emotions that come up in the course of everyday life. So I feel like a lot of the emotional work that I've done, I mean, obviously I, I do want to address it in the moment when it happens, but more important is addressing it before it ever happens, mm. right? So my goal is <clears throat> not necessarily to be able to deal with my anger as it arises. My goal is to become a person who just doesn't get angry. Right. So again, it goes back to, to all the things we talked about before, to, to building that character. I want to be the kind of person who is who has such a grasp on what's important in life and what isn't 
that when this annoying little thing happens, it really doesn't bother me because I Mm. know at a visceral level that it's really not important. Mm. So that character building, that perspective taking, that physics that we were talking about earlier, it all goes into the same package, which is helping you get the right perspective on life. Mm. Or as Hado says, you know, rising above your partial perspective and taking that universal perspective Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so I think that really helps. I'm going to ask you to give me really specific examples of how you do that. So with um, the Eastern tradition, let's say, um, you can do meditation. I've got a couple of, I mean, I really like the Waking Up app, Sam Harris. <laughs> Actually, Bill Irvin has got, do you know the Waking Up app? I don't use it. I've heard of it. Um, okay, so Bill Irvin has got a little um, contemplative, a, a stoic kind of um, course on it. And it's really interesting because he does talk about what um, Eastern meditation gets you to do in terms of, you know, just allowing things to come, allowing things to go, emotions, etc. cetera. Um, and then he taps into how the stoics meditate. So I'm wondering, could you give me, us, Hopefully there'll be us. <laughs> um, could you give me, yeah, because you also mentioned um, Confucianism, um, I think. Um, yeah. So what, are the, what does the practice look like for you? How do you do what you do in terms of ident- the before anger stuff? How are you building up to that on a daily basis? Something for me to do when we, <laughs> when we, when we log off. <laughs> Like you mentioned earlier, you said for a while you were waking up with Marcus Aurelius every morning, mm. meditations. That, that's my daily practice. I mm. read from one of the original Stoic sources. Epictetus is my go-to. I mean, he's like, I can always tell if it's been too long since I read Epictetus because I can feel <laughs> the, the dip in my, my character and my energy levels toward okay. being motivated. Um, Seneca offers a lot of material, so I'm going through the letters right now, Seneca's letters, the mm. Braver and Long Translation, which is really, really wonderful. Yes, I've got it right here. Yes. That's great. Yes, I really <laughs> recommend. Yeah. So I, do, I, I read through, I copy out passages by hand that I think are important. Later, I, I try to type them into a document because I feel like that physical, you know, repeating the repetition. Mm. It really does help you to get them ingrained in your mind. Mm. I think the more you can work with these, not just quotes, but actually sitting down and thinking it through. Mm. So I don't, I don't actually have a journaling practice, but I, I write a lot for mm. you know, my blog, Living in Agreement, and you know various other things we're doing. We're organizing our Stoicon X Women Conference. Yes. At the <laughs> I think the more you can actually spend time just keeping the concepts in your mind, whatever you're doing, if you're talking with friends about it, if you're reading something on mm. the internet, if you're watching a YouTube video, whatever you can do, keeping that in your mind. I, I find a direct correlation between the amount of time I'm able to spend mm. with Stoic concepts, doing whatever, but just keeping the concepts in my mind. There's mm. a direct correlation between that and my my ability to deal with problems. Mm. I don't know if it's just me or if everybody is that way, but mm. the the more I'm able to spend time doing it, the better. There are times, I will say, when I was working full time last year, I I had so little time, you know, I full time job, taking care of three kids and doing various other things as well. It was an extreme challenge to be able to to find the time, but you have to. One thing mm. is that you know, don't wait for philosophy to find you. You have to make time for a philosophy. And it's so true. You have to build it in, even just snatches, you know, have have the wallpaper on your phone or listen mm. to a podcast five minutes at a time if you have to, you know, just find some kind of way to keep it in your mind as much as possible because it's a lot easier to return to yourself when you have those concepts readily available. Mm. And I like the idea of having like wallpaper on your phone, et cetera. I mean, that's kind of the, the quotable quotes, right? But then you also mentioned earlier that you keep going back and doing deep, well, time permitting, of course, <clears throat> you keep going back and doing deeper reading and, and research and then coming back out and sort of, and I think that reminds me of that chapter in Hado's philosophy uh, as a way of life, the writing chapter, the spiritual exercises chapter. He talks about, I think it was Philo of Alexandria um, who yeah, is that right? 
um, left us a kind of a list of what the ancient spiritual practices, writing practices were like, and memorization, um, um, paraphrasing, that sort of thing. So writing and then talking and researching, a bit of reading. Yeah, so as you say, a bit of everything. And uh, I've definitely, you, you mentioned copying things out by hand and that's definitely been part of my practice, copying, oh. like copying. Um, and I've also, in my group, my Stoic Salon group, I've run a number of journaling challenges and one of the, the, the starting exercises is literally just to sit with the text and to copy it. And that seems to be the most popular for people. It's the one that seems to, they, they, they say that it's the one that made me most engage with the text because we're so in a rush these days to, to think about things and analyse things and respond to things and, and see how things relate to us, whereas just by sitting with the text, it's, it's really an invitation to just I think, yeah, sit and listen, yeah. Yeah, it's something we don't do often enough these days. I mean, it is a classical way of learning. I think a lot yeah. of cultures throughout history have done that copying and, and we don't really do it these days so it is yeah i also i also really like that physical connection even though mm -hmm. it's just your hand moving across the page when you're copying there's just something about that physical process that mm. is different from from typing or just from talking and it's mm. kind of interesting that it should be so mm. but, but it is and that's another reason i've I've been trying to incorporate and build a, a stoic yoga practice. I'm still experimenting. I'm I'm not a skilled yogi, so <laughs> how would you do that? Would you how would you do a stoic yoga practice? Well, so yoga is actually very philosophical. I, do you practice at all or have you practiced? i I do a bit of yoga with Adrian and that's it. Oh yeah, that was <laughs> very I mean it's sweet. Right? Yeah, yeah, sweet. And, and just for whoever drops by, it's not really that deep or anything. Yes. So yoga originally was based on a philosophy. And if you, it depends on what kind of practice you're doing, but there are opportunities to really go deeper and, you know, make connections. And I have found that a lot of what I see is really self-centered with yes. the, the yoga fitness stuff. And it's always bothering yeah. me. And yet yoga itself is so healthy. Mm. So I'm trying to incorporate the stoic principles that I love into this fitness regimen. So I'm telling myself, like, I'm standing there doing tree pose. I'm like, okay, Seneca says you are rooted and strong like a tree. You know, the tree is buffeted by wind and it grows stronger. You know, so there, there are ways you can make the connections. <laughs> okay, you need a YouTube channel. <laughs> I, have I have one stoic video on my Brittany Pollat channel, but um, I, I need to, I want to do it right if I ever do it. So I need better equipment. I, I need to, to do things differently. But yeah, if you want to check it out, it's there right now. Oh my God. I, would, I want, I want you to do more. Yeah. Okay. Get your equipment and just do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start hounding you. I know that's not going to be very stoic, but I'm going to be like, have you done it? Um, I love that so much just like doing tree pose and just bringing Seneca in or, or um, sorry, I just dropped. Uh, <laughs> speaking of equipment, <laughs> I need to set up a little good studio. But I did want to finally get around to the really exciting thing that we're both <laughs> involved in and that's Stoic on X women and you're leading the group and, um, you know, heading the organisation. So tell me how you feel about it, first of all. What does it mean to you to have a Stoic on X women? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think we're both super excited about this opportunity, right? This is something people have been talking about for a long time, and it's just never happened before. So I feel very honored to be a part of the team. And we're also working with Phil Yanoff and Donald Robertson. So it, it's a great opportunity, first of all, to just bring women together, because I think, I mean, people have made this point many times before, but a lot of women in the Stoic community, we're there, but our voices are quieter. We don't mm -hmm. always like pipe up in an argumentative sort of way um, to, to prove our points or prove that we're right or argue about philosophical theory, that kind of thing. We're there, we're watching, we're practicing. Um, and so this is a time for us to come together and really just connect. We're, we're doing the networking luncheon, which we're all super excited about. Yeah. To, to hear women's voices and feel like, you know what, I'm not alone. 
because I mm-hmm. think obviously now more than ever, we, we sometimes feel like we're alone, but we're not. We, we do mm-hmm. have a community, a flourishing, thriving community. Um, so just getting that chance to make connections. And then, of course, we're hearing from lots of wonderful women, some leading experts, Sharon LaBelle, very excited to hear from her, yeah. and also some, some new voices as well. So it's going to be great. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I'm really excited just to, yeah, just for a day of women's voices. And also, I don't know how this is going to sound, but do, at this point in time, do women talking about stoicism sound different to, and I don't, yeah, no, it's not working what I'm going to say, but I just kind of feel that different voices, um, different generations, different experience, lived experiences, approach a philosophy in a different way, maybe. Um, and depending on whether you approach it from a more theoretical angle or from, you know, coming to it from um, a self-help angle or coming from it to solve a hardship in your life um, or from, you know, a position of grief, etc. all those experiences. I've, I've been actually talking to quite a few women lately, actually, and um, stoicism appeared in their life, um, again, due to some sort of algorithm on like Kindle algorithms or like some algor- algorithm because they were obviously searching for some solution to something. And... Um, yeah, so it is interesting. I'm very excited about it. I'm 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 interested in in whether it sounds different. And also, of course, we've both talked about the idea of um, coming away with practical tips on on the doing of it, not just the reading or the thinking about it. But that's why now seeing you now in a yoga pose, sort of memorizing or, or, or thinking about Seneca, that's something that I can take away and do sort of, I could, I can, I can even introduce that into my meditative walks with, I mean, I walk a lot with my dog and I try to um, not take a telephone with me or anything like that and just be totally attentive to her and then also just be just mindful. So I can bring some um, Seneca with me or some Marcus Aurelius with me. So that's, I like, I like these conversations that are happening since we've met and since we started talking about Stoke on X women. Um, and, and I'm not suggesting that that's not inherent in the male experience either because, of course, it was Hado that influenced me, but I think Hado had such a gorgeous, sensitive take oh, on. Yeah. And, I, and I think Marcus Aurelius has um, uh, an approach to it that's so sensitive and so so gentle, um, which was definitely what I wanted to hear. I didn't want the hard love. I've heard people talk about stoicism as hard love. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's hard love at all. I think it's, especially in, in the voice of Marcus Aurelius, it's a really gentle. Yeah, it's a perspective taking, I think. Yeah. And yeah. the interesting thing about Hado is he was a priest before he mm. started, you know, his philosophical career. So to me, I think he has, maybe that helped him gain an understanding of the human mm. condition, you know? So yeah. he brought that perspective, which other philosophers haven't really had mm-hmm. um, you know he lived through world war ii he he worked as some kind of i believe some kind of mechanic you know in the war effort or something like that uh, so he had these life experiences i think mm-hmm. he didn't just go straight through studying philosophy and mm-hmm. to me that just makes a world of difference in in your perspective on life and mm-hmm. so I, I i sometimes wonder if that contributed to his his beautiful perspective Mm, most definitely yeah (laughs) wow Brittany this was really interesting and my mind is buzzing now I have of course could keep you here for hours more but I know that you have to go I do want to ask you to just give me a quick sort of summary of yourself what have you written where do you write where can we find more of you follow you um what are your, what's your kind of main aspiration? What's the next project you're working on? Just a quick kind of bio. Mm-hmm. Well, one of my main projects right now is livinginagreement.com. So this is where I call it humanist stoicism. So I'm looking from a, like a moral psychology, moral philosophy perspective. 
incorporating these different wisdom traditions, like I was talking about earlier, and also some contemporary psychology research, just mm -hmm. trying to answer some questions about how to live a stoic life in the 21st century that obviously weren't answered in the first century. So um, just kind of building a, a bigger picture of what it means to be a stoic through mm -hmm. that. Obviously, I'm super excited about our upcoming Stoicon Women Conference. Um, also talking with Eve Riches right now about creating a site for Stoic caring. So mm -hmm. resources for people who are carers, professional carers, or people who want to get more involved in their communities, or people who are just interested in Stoicism and say, hey, Stoicism is about not caring. We can say, yes, it is about caring. So, um, yeah, so that might be taking off soon. It's Where's that going to be? Is that got a house online yet or a home? Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. We're very <clears throat> so I, okay. I can provide more information about that later. But that sounds exciting. Yeah. So mm -hmm. lots of lots of things going on in the Stuart community. Yeah. All right. So thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. It was thank a pleasure so to meet you. It has been a pleasure meeting you and working with you on Stoke on X Women. Really excited. Like Thanks that. for the chat. And um, hopefully we'll get to chat again soon. Have a lovely day. I know you're off to pick up your son from, what, is that school? Is it you picking up, him up from school? Yeah, he does a, yeah. a little preschool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is he a young stoic or? Definitely not. <laughs> That's the mum's job. <laughs> All right. Well, have a lovely, lovely day. Thank you so much. Thank you. You too. <laughs> See you.